Hi, everyone. Uh, so welcome to our session. Uh, my name is Isabel Jimenez. Uh, I'm a district systems engineer at Mesosphere. I work uh, with the security team. And uh, this is uh, Kapil, so I'll let him introduce. So hi, um, I'm Kapil Arya. I'm a distributed systems engineer as well at Mesosphere. I'm also Apache Mesos committer and a DMDCB developer. So um, in this talk, we are going to uh, talk about the process migration aspects in the container orchestration world. And let's get started. So here is a brief overview of what uh, this talk is going to look like. So we'll first jump into the motivation and see why do we need this and why are we actually talking about uh, it here. Next, we'll introduce the concepts behind process migration and checkpointing and so on, followed by the introduction to Apache Mesos, which is a two-level scheduler for the data centers. And then there will be uh, the, uh, the combination of checkpointing or process migration with Apache Mesos, and we'll see a, a demo at the very end. So let's get started for uh, the motivation. So the key thing here to notice is the, uh, the idea of stateless versus stateful application. In the whole container world, we always talk about the stateless applications where you actually don't have any local state. You start from a vanilla image, and then you are performing transactions. Things are being stored uh, in, in a remote storage somewhere. It could be a distributed or a, a centralized version. The kill of an application instance doesn't really affect the performance as much because all of these transactions that are happening are pretty uh, atomic and pretty simple. However, in case of stateful applications, the application by definition has a local state. And so if you were to say kill an application a few minutes into execution and it has not say taken a, a snapshot or has not saved the progress, you lose the compute time up until the, uh, uh, the current point from the last uh, time you saved it. So here, again, you start from some image, but you are doing some pre-computation to get to a work state where you actually start beginning to do your real work. And uh, graceful, uh, the non-graceful shutdowns will result in the loss of compute time. If, you, if it were a graceful shutdown, then the application will know that it has to save the state, whatever it has locally, to a remote server or, or, or a database or so on. So when we are dealing with scheduling of such applications, stateful and stateless, the stateless applications are fairly straightforward in that sense. Uh, when you scale up, you basically launch the new instances on new nodes or a new cluster. And they are pretty much starting all from the, uh, the vanilla image. The idea being that everything is an immutable uh, image. And so you start from there, you do the transactions, and when you want to scale down something, you just kill the extra instances. Uh, if, the, if the need comes and you want to, say, schedule some high priority task, you can easily kill the additional instances that are no longer needed or that need to be preempted. And your high priority task can actually get the node or the resources right away. However, in terms of, uh, in case of the stateful application, the scaling up may or may not be uh, difficult depending on how the application has been written. For example, if it's an application which has to do some pre-computation or a, a initialization phase, then it will need that much time before the application is productive. To kill an application that is already running, if it's not a graceful shutdown, then you will lose the computation time and so on. So basically, what that means is if you have a high priority task coming in, then killing some instances of the stateful application will definitely result in some compute time loss. And similarly, you can think uh, the same things for the, the cases when you have to move some application instances from one node to another. This could be because you want to take the node down for maintenance, or there's some hardware failure, and so on and so forth. So in short, uh, what we can kind of say is that the modern container orchestration tools are actually optimized for stateless applications. I'm not saying they are designed for stateless applications, but they are more optimized towards stateless applications because that is what the entire world is using. You have this immutable state, and that's or this immutable image where you start from, do the computation, kill it, and then if you have to start, you start from scratch. So the question then is, how can we make it better for the stateful applications to, to run and to survive in this, uh, in, in this uh, world which is optimized for stateless applications? Well, the answer is really simple. You know, make them stateless, and then you are done. Well, that's fine. But how do we make them stateless? So that's the next question. And the answer is something that you won't like. You know, rewrite them. You know, start from scratch. Now this time we'll write a stateless application. 
Again, not scalable, not something that you want to tell your developers to do. Uh, I wouldn't like if someone were to tell me to do this. So what's an alternate? The alternate here is to combine the, the application with the notion of process or container checkpointing, and then do migration and, and uh, things on top of that. So this is uh, what we will talk into this next, uh, next section about process migration. I'll introduce what actually it means and how it actually applies to the uh, applications and so on. So before we begin, just a, a brief overview of the terminology. When we say process migration, people usually refer to migrating a single operating system process, like a, <coughs> excuse me, a single Linux process to take it from one node to another. When you talk about container migration, then we are talking about a container which can have more than one processes in there. We are migrating it to a different node. Finally, uh, a virtual machine migration, for example, the, virtual, uh, the VMware vMotion, which I believe everyone has heard of, where you take the entire virtual machine and migrate it to a new node or a new data center, maybe across the continent. So in all these cases, the, the key point here is that the process or the container or the virtual machine was running before. After the migration, it also continues to run. So we'll see what actually is involved in doing such a migration. So this is like a, a very general recipe that pretty much works on all these scenarios. You first pause the running process or the container or the virtual machine so that the state is now immutable. You then take a snapshot of the current state. You copy over the snapshot to the target node or the new data center or the new cluster. And finally, you restart from that snapshot that you just took and you have the application or the virtual machine up and running. So the, the taking the snapshot part is often referred to as checkpointing or snapshotting, or, um, and the restart part is uh, uh, called restart, just uh, plain and simple. The one key thing to note here in terms of process migration is that you want to make sure that it's actually not visible to the outside world. Because if the outside world can notice that the application is not there, then that's actually bad for the application. The way we do that is to ensure that you have the minimal downtime. It's like as obvious. And in these four steps, the biggest time that is consumed is in taking the snapshot and then moving it along to the new node. So if you have a huge application, then it may take on the order of seconds or minutes to take the snapshot of the running application. Then migrating it across a, a network to the next uh, node or the next cluster is going to be an expensive operation. Ideally, one would want this to be on the order of milliseconds. So there are a lot of shortcuts and uh, ticks, uh, tips and techniques that people use uh, and have actually uh, researched over the years. For example, there are things like uh, demand paging and doing the delta compression and taking the snapshot at regular intervals so that you actually only move the pages which have, modi have been modified since the last time you moved and so on. So basically in all of these cases, you're trying to reduce the, the, the time spent in step two and three. Okay, so sometimes you often have these two application instances running, one on the original node, one on the new node, but the new node, the new instance or the migrated instance has not actually properly caught up, and you actually keep taking this uh, incremental snapshot, moves them across, and eventually you have a very tiny window where you shut down the first, uh, the original application, move the latest state to the newer one, and then restart it there. So I won't go into the details of how this is done. There are several research papers and uh, uh, like blog posts to handle this. So in terms of checkpointing, when, when someone says we are trying to checkpoint a process or a container or a virtual machine, what does it mean? So the, the textbook definition would be checkpointing or checkpoint restart is the ability to save the state of a set of running processes on disk so that you can later restart them. Okay, so it's a very simple thing. You have this computation running on this set of nodes. You take a snapshot. Now you have a bunch of files on disk. Now, because they are files, you can move them over, you can copy them over network, or you can uh, do all sorts of operations on them. And finally, when it's time to restart, you just take the image and you basically restore the process state or the application state from that particular snapshot that you have. Okay? Now, how is checkpointing related to process migration? So process migration inherently requires checkpointing. So all you are doing is you take the snapshot, so you are checkpointing, and in, in, in some sense, you are actually restarting it at, at the same time while you are taking the checkpoint. So you want to minimize the time that is needed for checkpoint and restart by parallelizing uh, some of these operations. So for the sake of simplicity, we'll just actually look into checkpointing. The optimizations are something that we can do uh, later on. 
So now I want to give a quick demo of how the checkpointing feels like. Okay, so it's a very dead simple demo. I'll show you the, the C file that you can see here. It's a while one loop where we print the counter and then sleep for two seconds, like nothing fancy in here. And if I run the binary, you can see it's just counting one, two, three, and, and sleeping in between. So for the purposes of this demo, what I'm using is uh, the DMTCP tool. So now I'm trying to launch this application. I'm using the interval flag, so saying to check, uh, take a checkpoint every five seconds, and then test. So we'll see that in about five seconds, it will take a snapshot, so it should be five seconds by now, and I'm killing the application. So notice that I killed right after four. I'm looking at the list here, and I have a .dmtcp checkpoint image. So let me see if I can show you the sizes as well. So it's roughly two megabytes uh, at this point, 2.9 megabytes, the checkpoint image size. Now at some point, I can move this checkpoint image to a new node, or in this case, for the purpose of the demo, I'll just restart from the checkpoint image. So DMTCP restart and the, uh, the image name. And as you can see, it resumed from like right after it took checkpoint. So it took checkpoint sometime after it printed three and it resumed right away. So that's pretty much the demo. So uh, going over some quick use cases for checkpointing, traditionally, Checkpointing has been used mostly in the HPC world where things are really compute intensive and losing like even an hour of compute time is pretty bad because you are running this application on thousands of nodes and losing one CPU hour means you are losing 10,000 CPU hours from your uh, overall quota of uh, allotment and so on. So fault tolerance was the very original use case where you have your application running on a thousand nodes and what if one node goes down? Do you want to lose like the entire computation? No, you actually want to take snapshots so that if you lose something, you restart from the previous one and you are good to go. Scheduling and process migration we already talked about. Debugging is also a very interesting use case. So think of the checkpoint image as your ultimate bug report. So you have your program running, you are taking frequent checkpoints, and the time where it fails, you actually just take the previous checkpoint and send it on to the developers of the application because they'll restart from the checkpoint. It will be exactly the same scenario. They'll run and eventually get back into the bug, assuming, of course, that there are no races at all. Because if you have races, then you can uh, uh, run it multiple times. There is also this uh, faster startup times. So as we talked, if you have a huge initialization time for some application, then instead of running 10,000 application instances which are doing the same computation to initialize some data set, you can have one application or one instance initialize for four hours, take a snapshot, and then restart 1,000 copies of it. So that basically saves you a bunch of CPU cycles. And then there are things like save restore of workspace, like if you are working on a MATLAB session and you have a bunch of windows open, you don't want to recreate them every time. Just take a snapshot, take it on a USB key with, uh, with you, and restart on your laptop. Speculative execution and managing long tails. The last one is actually quite, uh, I'm really fond of this. So these days we have 16 core machines or 24 core machines or 32 core machines, like really fat machines, and you have these multi-threaded applications. So what if you have an application which has 16 threads and they run for say 16 hours or 12 hours, and then 15 of these threads have exited, but there's this one thread which is going to take another four hours to do some accumulation or some post-processing of the data that the other 15 threads uh, generated. In, in most cases, the 15 remaining cores are getting wasted because you actually claimed the cores or the resources for the entire application, but the current application is actually single-threaded. So this is what it means by managing tails. So you can, in a sense, you can optimize these things by moving 16 such processes onto a single node so that each thread is actually consuming one core, and now you have the 15 cores or 15 nodes available to do other work. So anyway, in terms of the uh, stateful applications, so the, the claim roughly here is that if you take a stateful application and add checkpointing to it, it is almost equivalent to a stateless application. It won't be like as smooth because you will have to take checkpoints, checkpointing will take time and so on, but it's almost equivalent to having a stateless application. And that's what I meant uh, in the beginning when we said how to make stateful applications uh, stateless. So again, scaling up now is trivial. You take a checkpoint, you replicate it across all the nodes and you restart from there. You scale down, you checkpoint the application which takes on the order of seconds, kill it, and uh, migration is uh, fairly straightforward. So one thing to note here 
is the cost of checkpointing is often dependent on the, the memory footprint that the application has. Because if you have a memory footprint of a gigabyte, and you are writing a checkpoint image to a regular, say, uh, disk, then assuming that it's like roughly 100 megabytes per second, it will take 10 seconds to dump the checkpoint image. Now, if you have some fancy hardware backend, like Luster File System or some, uh, some of those things, then you can get pretty amazing speeds, like 60, mega, 60 gigabytes per second and so on. But depending on the cluster and the application, this is the time which actually is the uh, uh, overall bottleneck in terms of creating a checkpoint and so on. Okay, and so now I'll invite uh, Isabel to go over the Apache Mesos framework and uh, talk about checkpointing. Uh, yeah, so hello again. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Apache Mesos, um, or as we like to call it, uh, the data center kernel. So uh, the idea uh, behind the Apache Mesos, the project itself and the paper he's based on, uh, was to solve uh, two main problems. So deploying applications uh, in data centers is becoming more and more difficult, almost impossible. Uh, most of, uh, traditionally, data centers are static, static partitioned. So, um, the idea was why can't we run applications as easily as we run applications on our data center as easily as we run applications on our phone? Um, Mesos is trying to solve that problem and also building distributed systems is very hard. Um, it takes a lot of uh, dif different scenarios and having to, uh, to manage a distributed application means taking care of state, taking care of resources. Uh, so those are all difficult things to do and uh, Mesos provides a solution for that. How does it do that? Uh, it abstracts uh, the data center as one computer. So basically it aggregates all the resources of all the different machines in the data center and provides them as one, as a single block. So we at Mesosphere, uh, we are building what you can call uh, an Apache Mesos distribution. It's called a data center operating system. So in this definition, you can see that it, it applies to uh, the computer hardware resources. So now what we want to do is apply it to the data center hardware resources. And that's how you do a data center operating system. So the main concepts to uh, understand behind how Mesos works is this, Mesos it's a, a two-level scheduler. Uh, it's based on uh, this offer-based model. So Mesos itself uh, cannot run applications on its own. It needs this second scheduler. So we, if you've heard about Mesos and uh, you've probably heard about these things called Mesos frameworks. Uh, a Mesos framework is simply a distributed system that has a Mesos scheduler. So, like I was saying, Mesos, it's this abstraction, this kernel abstraction for a data center, but it's also a, an easy way to write distributed systems. So, when you, the most popular one uh, among the Mesos ecosystem, uh, it's Marathon. So for example, when you have Marathon here in this schema, uh, you run the Marathon, that is a distributed system that has a Mesos scheduler. Uh, he'll, re he'll receive a resource offer from the Mesos master. Uh, he'll decide to launch a task on that offer. And then the Mesos master will execute that task on an executor the task will update its state to the master, and then he'll send the status back to Marathon. Uh, please note here that the executor is kind of separated from the Mesos itself, because uh, a Mesos framework can also provide a custom executor. So the second main concept behind this uh, abstraction of the data center is that in a partitioned data center, 
uh, there will be always times with, with idle resources. Whereas if you just aggregate everything, you'll be able to take advantage of all resources at all times. It saves a lot of money. So how does this actually work? Uh, the main three components of Mesos are the scheduler, the Mesos master, and, a Mesos, and, a, and the Mesos agent. So the Mesos agent starts by sending the resources available to the Mesos master. Then the master sends that as an offer to the scheduler, and the user decides to, uh, to act upon that offer. So uh, in this case, it's just a, a Docker uh, image uh, with the, the, resource, the resources on that offer. He can decide to just use partially uh, the resources that are on that offer. It's, there's not a problem. Uh, Mesos will take care of re, um, offering the, the left resources to another scheduler or to the same scheduler in another offer. So uh, then the scheduler sends the accepted offer to the Mesos master. The Mesos master simply sends it to the uh, agent the offer comes from. And once the task uh, has some uh, uh, state change, uh, like stage and running, it can also fail. Uh, it sends it back to master and it goes so forth until the, to the user. So here you can see that you can also provide an executor. Uh, you can also specify that you want to run on a custom executor. And at an agent level, what this does is that the agent uh, sends a task, the launch task, uh, command to the executor. The executor actually launched the process so the task uh, waits for the uh, for the task status to uh, to come back, and update the agent back, and so uh, forth. Like I said on the previous slides, so this line there that's kind of weird. It's the Mesos isolation that is provided at all times, whereas you use a custom executor or you use the default one on Mesos. Um, so all of this is. Very nice, but at that point, uh, when you start launching multiple schedulers on the meso on on Mesos, uh, the master becomes this message hub. So the way Mesos is implemented is using this algorithm for fair resource allocation. So um, it's a weighted uh, fair resource allocation, but it's not always uh, sufficient to guarantee that the resources are fairly shared. So you can also uh, plug in your own uh, allocation algorithm. There's a module, allocator module, so you can write your own. So at this point, you start, you start having something that looks more like a cluster. Uh, you have multiple agents. You have either multiple applications or just uh, multiple schedulers. And uh, Mesos provides also this highly available availability for its masters, as uh, you don't want a single point of failure for that. Uh, what it, how it works, it's uh, simply we use Zookeeper for consensus. So either when the scheduler or the agent are trying to, uh, to talk to the master, uh, they're, all, they're just uh, uh, find the master through the consensus on Zookeeper. Uh, so when you put it all together, that's probably a um, better illustration of how a real cluster looks like. Uh, you'll have uh, hundreds of applications running on schedulers, uh, like a pretty big quorum of masters. And um, a typical uh, data center running on Mesos can go to tens of thousands of nodes. So. Uh, this is more likely. Now, you, if I would show you this slide on the first time, you probably <laughs> be kind of um, disoriented. So, um, how do we join all these two-level scheduling and uh, with a, a container migration? Uh, I'm just going to make a small demo of with the, using Runcy. So, uh, why Runcy? Um, 
some of, uh, how many of you have, you heard, uh, have heard about OCI? Okay, cool, some of you. So um, OCI, it's uh, the Open Container Image Specification uh, that's trying to uh, standardize the way uh, you, you uh, defined what a container image is. Uh, so RANC is based on that. Uh, it's well integrated with CRIO. Uh, that's another, uh, with DMTCP, it's another uh, checkpoint service provider. Um, it's also a very lightweight uh, runtime for container. And it's compatible with Docker. So um, Mesos has uh, had Docker as a first class citizen for a uh, few releases now. <laughs> um, and having something uh, that I can run as an executor that is compatible with that will allows me, would allow me to not uh, change anything on the user interface side. So uh, what do I do now? I have my own scheduler that's, uh, that I call Vault. And when I run my application, I just do exactly the same thing. I, I precise uh, a Docker image, and I process my executor. So that will basically use, on the agent level, my executor. I'll just, uh, the agent will just talk to the Vault executor that will launch a task. And this task will not run in a Docker container on a Mesos container. It will run in a RANC container. So every time I launch a task, it will be on, my, uh, on the same sandbox, but it will be a RANC container on the same isolation provided by Mesos, but on the RANC container. So demo time. Okay, so here I have a Docker Compose file uh, that uh, basically creates a, a, a basic, very basic Mesos uh, cluster. So it has the most basic features, uh, a master, an agent, and my framework. So, uh, when I do Docker Compose, so, PS, I'll have my, my, my components running. I can see that now I can hit my, the Messius UI. I have uh, one agent available with the resources that are there. And this is my Vault UI. Um, so I can run an image on my Vault UI. Um, for the demo, I chose to, uh, to run a Redis container uh, because uh, Redis is this, um, <coughs> can be associated to this cache tool that uh, basically will keep everything in memory. Uh, so when you, you checkpoint it, you can and restart it again, you can see that the memory, what you put in memory is still there. So I'm just going to tell him two CPUs and 50, uh, 50 uh, memory. And here I'm going to say Redis. The command is Redis server. And I just specify, please don't use the default executor. Use mine. So I send that. And uh, I have my, uh, my task running uh, with this ID. It's the same one in the Mesos UI. You can see that. Uh, the Mesos master, my task is running. And I can go check the sandbox. So uh, in the sandbox, I have my executor. I can see that it runs, it was there, and it was used. And that it mounted, uh, it created the OCI bundle with the root FS for the Redis image. So you can see everything there. So this is all great. But what happens oh, when I go see on my, um, on my mini cluster? So I can create a, uh, I can exec into the, Docker slay, uh, um, sorry, the Mesos agent uh, container and um, see what's going on. So I can do a run C list and see that, uh, yeah, my, uh, my Redis is running. I can exec into it. So you can also exec 
create a pseudo TTY here, provide this and a command. So we're going to run bash too. Um, so the way run C is you have to be in the bundle. So now I am in my in my runc container writing the Redis image. And I can just do my Redis CLI and for example we can put um, a simple okay, sorry about that. Uh, so when I get hello, it says whirl. <laughs> Um, so uh, this is just like a simple branchy container running, nothing very fancy for now. Uh, let me just quit. Whoa. And great, uh, nothing fancy. So in my UI, I made these uh, two buttons. Uh, for checkpointing and restart. So this uh, almost download button here, or maybe you don't see it very well, um, will checkpoint that uh, container. So when I checkpointed here, my tasks failed. Why is that? Because right now, the way we integrated for the demo, uh, it's not integrated in Mesos. So the current State states available for a Mesos tasks do not include checkpointed or restarted or checkpointing or any or migrating. Uh, they're only Mesos tasks for now. So that's one of our aims through uh, through this demo. It's to uh, to make the community uh, help us integrate that with Mesos uh, by creating demand. <laughs> So um, here, when I do run C list, I see that my container is no longer running, and that is still there. So I can actually check uh, the checkpointed image that it's here. Uh, this is what resemble, uh, looks uh, a checkpointed image. This, these are the files that are actually used uh, for the restart. So when I, oh my god, sorry. Okay. Uh, so when I go back and I use my second button that actually uh, restarts my uh, the my container from that checkpointed image, I just hit that, and it's it regains the same thing. It, it just restarts with the same task ID. So the state just comes back as running. And when I go back to the Messios UI, I just see that I had my task failed five minutes ago, and that now it's running again. In the sandbox is exactly the same one. So uh, if I go back and I do run the list, my, con my container is now running again. And I can, I'm already in the bundle, so I can ex exec as I was, as I did before, on my container ID. And when I run my Redis CLI, and I do a get hello, the world is still there. So, uh, like Kapil was saying, this can open windows to uh, the ultimate debugging, like he was calling it, uh, process migration, so live migration between uh, nodes and all of those cool things that come with checkpointing, but in a distributed way. Um, now, the th things that are left to be done in, on the Mesos part is that as we were making, as we made Docker a first class citizen to run uh, containers in Mesos, we'd like to make checkpointing a first class uh, integrated in Mesos. So provide checkpointing as a service uh, in Mesos. Um, it's not trivial. 
um, we still need to make uh, it, all the transactions transparent to the scheduler and the executor. We'll need to integrate the task states into Mesos directly. Uh, so add new task states, as I was saying, checkpointed, restoring. Uh, we also love to uh, support multiple checkpoint services per later. So right now I use Rancy because it's well integrated with Docker and it uses Crew. Um, but for uh, live migration uh, that uh, Kapil showed before uh, in his in his demo, DMTCP works uh, way better, and it's not about uh, better or not. It's about uh, user friendly friendly experience. So DMTCP actually allows you to have a, a better experience in a user level. Um, Crew, it's. Uh, it's more system oriented. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, uh, do you have any questions? So uh, this, thank you. Uh, this was good. Uh, what question I had is, um, have you, with the migration for containers mechanism, have you done any performance studies on what the limitations of it are. Um, to give you an example, um, let's say you have a very, very high performing um, network application. Take, and take for example something like um, you, you want to put in um, an EPC, like an Evolved Packet Core or, or a mobile gateway or something like that with, with such sort of an infrastructure. Um, that is, you know, that handles really, really high traffic. And what happens is that a lot of times uh, you, you can't shut that down, migrate it to another uh, host and stuff like that. And this would be extremely useful, but uh, at, at this point, I mean, we're looking at process migration with VMs, and you know, there's a certain class of applications that, that you cannot use this for. You know? So as in how, I think, hopefully, at least my hope is as in how, you know, people move away from VMs to using containers to creating these as microservices. Those class of applications where you cannot use process migration or container migration continues to shrink. Um, but I'd still like to hear your views on, uh, you know, what what limitations are from from that perspective uh, over here, or or if you if you've done any studies on it. I'll let Kapil. So I guess the. The fundamental thing still hasn't changed, that the cost in terms of migration is still there. So no matter whether we go from virtual machines to uh, single processes or containers, that particular cost will always be there. Now the thing is, um, if you have, say, network, like heavy network traffic on a given, uh, with a given process, then there's not much you can do fundamentally to change that. There are some, uh, some research articles which actually point to having this uh, duplication or deduplication going on in parallel. So you have the instance of process running uh, as, a, as a slave of the first process and all, but that again is, uh, is not something that you can just like, put out and say, like, this actually solves uh, all your problems. So yeah, there, is, there is no easy answer to that, uh, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. <laughs> More questions? Okay, thanks again then. <laughs>